people don't necessarily, you know, completely understand the nuances of the immune system, given that um, it's played such an important role in cancer uh, optimism over the past two decades, and given that it's probably about to play more of an important role mm -hmm. as we go forward, I, I think it's worthwhile for the listener and viewer to understand how the immune system works with respect to cancer. Because when we talk about TIL, when we talk about checkpoint inhibitors, which we've already touched on, uh, I don't want people to be lost. Uh, so unfortunately, this is one of those moments in this podcast where you got to buckle your seatbelt up a little bit. Um, yeah. But it, it but it pays dividends um, because you become a very educated consumer of of how these drugs work. Yeah. So let me let me kind of layer the onion this way, um, which is I, I find it most useful, and I'd say this even in talking to patients. Um, so they're you know my my lay audience, uh, if you will, uh, to start with um, you know the concept that, that the immune system needs to find levers that it can grab onto, as in differences, things that are fundamentally different um, than normal cells. Uh, we, we, our immune system is trained um, in fetal development um, to, to do exactly that and, and, and quote unquote only that, um, except for the fact that we unfortunately hold on to self-recognizing immune cells and those can cause autoimmune disease, which is not the topic of our conversation today. Um, but basically, um, it, so when you consider you know, what's, what's different about cancer cells and what, you know, what have we learned over the decades on that topic, there are a variety of differences. Um, now, I'm going to start here because it's kind of gives a little bit of chronology in a way. Uh, we, we, we began to understand some time ago that um, a, lot, a common feature of cancer cells is that they behave um, like their uh, sort of progenitors or precursors. Like in development, right, all mature cells in the body come from a, you know, a, well, a stem cell of, you know, of, a, of some sort. Um, and there's lineage and different, different lineages and different types of stem cells. Uh, but ultimately, you see cancers actually adopt sort of a biological behavior that's like backing up, if you will, in the developmental um, process. Um, and this is part of the, just a co consequence of the genetic alterations, sort of the combination lock, as I often refer to it, of genetic alterations that can lead to cancer is that that's one of the programs um, that they typically adopt. And it turns out that developmental cells um, have surface um, you know, proteins, uh, surface you know, markers, if you will, that are not expressed in, in uh, uh, fully mature tissues. Uh, and the immune system can see those. Um, so that's well documented. And Steve Rosenberg's early successes actually were, were you know, uh, identifying uh, those immune cells that existed in people that could recognize uh, you know, those, those types of antigens. So, so these are referred to as cancer testis antigens. So just think of that as kind of this developmental sort of biology. Turns out there are also, interestingly, some what we refer to as lineage antigens, so like you know uh, surface markers that you know kind of tag a certain you know cell type that the immune system interestingly can recognize, even though we think of those as being more like self. Um, but you know we 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 see that we see evidence that that the immune system reacts uh, to those, and that there are you know cell therapies um, as you were alluding to before um, that also take advantage of that. The the big discoveries of the recent you know several years have been that. Carcinogens cause mutations um, in genes that then, you know, the, those genes encode first RNA and then proteins, and and the altered amino acid sequence of the protein that can be recognized. So those are intracellular almost always um, those those proteins. But we have a machinery in our cells, all, all cells in the body, um, including those cells that go on to become cancer, that basically breaks down those proteins as they age um, and will present. A representative set, if you will, of those broken down protein fragments or peptides, um, to uh, you know present them, meaning on the cell surface, in the context of these um, uh, you know molecules we refer to as major histocompatibility um, receptors, as they're you know uh, kind of alluded to. But the idea is that they're 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 trying to show the wares, if you will, the the inner, inner contents of a cell to the immune system. Um, because we think that because of that is that that virally infected cells you know have an infection inside. Um, we think this is how this you know machinery um, was ever uh, uh, you know how it ever evolved in the first place. And so kind of showing the inner contents, if you will, is a way of being able to like let the immune system know that there's a virally infected cell. Well, that same machinery exists again in every cell. Um, and by the way, if cells stop doing that, there's a branch of the immune system stop stop presenting antigens at all. Um, antigens is a new word. I meant to um, introduce that. Antigen means 
a difference, like a, a protein fragment that's being presented and seen as different. We call that an antigen, and it can come in these different categories that I'm talking about. Um, so basically, if a cell, if a cancer cell were trying to hide itself, if you will, by not expressing um, these receptors to present antigens, then there's actually a branch of the immune system that's basically, you know, natural killer cells, as they're called. They're very primordial immune cells that are supposed to just you know, swoop in and and kill those cells, and, and we have evidence that that does occur. So, so let's just let's just pause here, Keith, to make sure people are following the anthropology of this. Um, so, basically, you have a row of homes, and each person in their home is responsible for demonstrating the contents of their home. So, they reach inside and they pull out various items from their home, and they leave them on the curb. And the, you know, the military is coming down the street inspecting the contents on the curb. And they're just making sure that it's all stuff that we've pre-agreed is safe, yep. right? right? So That's what right. they know, they don't know the entire repertoire of what could be presented, but they have a very clear list of what is acceptable. And they're basically just identifying anything that is not on the acceptable list. And if anything right. shows up and it's not on the acceptable list, the house is destroyed. Furthermore, if you leave nothing on your curb, either because you're too incompetent or you're nefarious and you're trying to hide what's in your home, there's another branch of the military that comes along and just blows up your house. So failing to play the game <laughs> results in a, in a yeah. loss of home. That's right. Yeah, well said. So that so that's the beginning, right? I mean, it's this kind of sampling, if you will, like you said, of the of the inner contents. Um, uh, and and so that that's important to recognize because you know if you kind of start with this core principle that cancer is a quote unquote genetic disease, meaning that mutations that happen in key genes that um, disable cells' ability to repair DNA damage um, as a common um, you know, a feature of cancers, for example, or mutations that activate some of those surface receptors or downstream signaling molecules that we talked about before. Um, those uh, mutations we've learned in recent years can be seen as different. Um, so they like, you know, kind of began to, you know, increase the kind of the toolbox, if you will, um, uh, of handles that the immune system can latch onto. So if you think about it that way, the cancers, you know, um, you know, begin to form potentially uh, if they're witnessed uh, by, you know, the immune cells as having a difference early, uh, we have lots of evidence that they can be eliminated. Um, and I mean, and there's actually kind of the, I guess, you know, uh, indirect, uh, you know, negative evidence, if you will, that people who have profoundly compromised immune systems will pop up with cancers. I mean, if you give people, you know, seriously, you know, high dose immunosuppressive medication for various other medical conditions, you will see cancers just kind of sprout up, um, you know, quickly and then certainly over time as well. Um, this immune surveillance concept is an inordinate amount of evidence um, in support of this idea that at, if at least keeping them down, you know, cancer, proto cancers down, if not outright eliminating them. Is that's just part of life on on planet Earth? Um, you know, sort of in the cosmic storm, if you will, with UV radiation as being you know one carcinogen I mentioned. Well, actually, gamma radiation <laughs> coming through the atmosphere is is also a, a cause of DNA damage. We have to kind of um, you know try to repair those uh, you know, that damage uh, inside of cells. I mean, when I say we, I'm, I'm again using the anthropomorphic inside of a cell uh, inner workings here. Um, and but you know but if the repair can't happen, we have this other mechanism of immune surveillance, uh, basically to wipe it out. So I, what I, the reason why I wanted to just kind of spend enough you know kind of words uh, you know on this concept is that basically people have to understand that by the time they're diagnosed with cancer, something's gone wrong, right? <laughs> basically, right? Like the, the the system didn't work um, to detect you know in this surveillance mode uh, the forming cancer. It didn't eliminate it. Um, how can that be? Well, it turns out that there, um, you know, for every, you know, kind of process that activates the immune system in response to an infection, just go with it, idea that that's like kind of, you know, the primary function of the immune system in terms of how it is that we ever kind of got out of the swamp in the first place evolutionarily, um, there's a break on the immune system. Like you can't just elaborate immune response, you know, indefinitely. I mean, imagine having the flu forever, like just dumping cytokines or immune system hormones into the bloodstream you know, cranking up, you know, body temperature, you know, and consuming a ton of metabolic resources in fighting infection and feeling bad as a consequence when you have the flu. You can't do that, like, you know, indefinitely. You gotta stop, you know, immune responses. Um, and so we have, you know, mechanisms to do that. Like it turns out a very elaborate set of mechanisms to do that. And cancers have just ever so craftily figured out 
uh, how to basically kind of reach into the genetic code, the blueprint, uh, and co-op mechanisms that will basically impede immune system recognition and response. That's the PD-1, PD-L1 story. So PD-1 we've talked about, that's the target of Keytruda. But what cancers do, it's a nasty little trick, um, is they've figured out how to, not all cancers, but, but the ones that are most responsive um, to Keytruda, they have figured out um, how to express on their surface uh, the, the, the foot that presses on the brake. Okay, so that's called PDL1, so program death hyphen L1, ligand 1, which basically reaches across to PD1 on T cells and tells them shut down, basically. Like mission accomplished, <laughs> don't need to do anything here. Um, and so, you know, a, a, a lung cell, an alveolar lung cell um, that ultimately becomes cancer, is not supposed to be expressing that, that, that that protein on its surface, right? It's not supposed to be regulating the immune system. That's like, that's not the, the natural job of a lung alveolar cell. Um, but a cancer that arises from that cell, uh, in many instances, basically, quote unquote, figures out how to express um, that protein. And so then blocking, you know, the interaction of the foot with the brake, like that's the magic, that's, there, there it is. Um, now that's just one mechanism, but as I said, it's actually produced a bigger incremental benefit in the cancer population than any single mechanism we've ever discovered in all of cancer biology research and therapeutic development history. So it's a pretty powerful one. But I'll just conclude with this statement that there are other mechanisms by which the immune system can be suppressed. Um, in fact, there's entire cell types in the immune system repertoire that are have a dampening effect on immune system response. And cancers can recruit them into their so-called microenvironment and create this very adverse environment for the T cells that could otherwise attack and kill. So it's like almost like assembling a force field by virtue of inviting in these non-cancerous cells, right? They're like, this is like can the cancer cells recruiting in um, these suppressive immune cells. So this is some of what we're up against. I mean, I just want to make it clear how kind of complicated it is. Um, yes, we were super grateful to have had this, you know, kind of eureka moment um, with you know, the success of PD-1 drugs. Uh, but, but cancers have co-opted multiple mechanisms by which they defend themselves in terms of you know, trying to close the gap then and use this immunotherapy concept much more broadly in cancer is going to require us to develop the understanding of, okay, well, which tricks are being pulled and how to be able to, you know, really target those very specifically. We can't disable people's immune systems. <laughs> like, that's not okay. Um, and so you, we, we do need a fair amount of precision and, um, you know, and, and figuring out kind of the sweet spot, if you will, in terms of what mechanisms cancers uh, are using uh, for this purpose.